Brought to you by BedroomBattlefields.com, this is the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. Gav Thorpe, Thomas Pirinen and now Andy Chambers. I can't promise we'll keep this up, but let's just enjoy it while it lasts, eh? First question, Andy then, why does he think this hobby still exists? Because people like doing things with their hands is, I think, at the heart of it all. Um, Ever since I started working in the 1990s, um, people have been predicting that digital video games, etc., would just edge out. Uh, all of the tabletop market, tabletop games, modeling, miniatures, all that kind of stuff. What you can do it better on a computer. But the fact is that there's something intensely satisfying about doing it for yourself and doing it physically with your own fingers, whether it's gluing things together or painting them or pushing them around the tabletop. There's a physicality to it that I think really appeals to us on a fundamental level, and that doesn't seem to have gone away. If anything, it's kind of intensified as the other media has got better. And, and more, literally, you know, I can have armies and paint them digitally in minutes. Why would I bother sticking them together? Um, because it's not really about that. It's not just about the having them. It's also the journey to getting them. And anybody who's, who's like, built an army or even a single miniature knows that there's a personal sort of level of personal investment that you put into it in the act of putting it together, painting it, imagining it to be yours. And I don't think... That's gone away. If, as I say, if anything, it's got stronger for us over time. So I think that's why the hobby still exists. What's your favourite book of all time? I have many favourite books. Is the truth that I mean, if you if you're going to like pin me down and torture me and say name one favourite book, Andy, it would probably have to be Lord of the Rings, rather boringly, but it is that kind of like central fountainhead um, of fantasy fiction if you will i mean it's not the only by any means and it's not the first and it's not the last by any means either but it's such a towering and titanic thing in its own right I'm really overselling it here aren't i but i'd go for lord of the rings but as i say i really wouldn't like to say that's my favorite book uh, as a as an exclusive thing because there's a lot of books that i really love just a bonus question what age were you when you first read that book or those books Oh, Lord of the Rings, we were on holiday in Wales. I think I was, no, older, 11, I think. Um, so, you know, reasonably advanced, and I could understand everything that's in there. Um, but, yeah, I was absolutely fascinated. Yeah, I did nothing else but but read the, the first book, The Fellowship of the Ring, while we were away on holiday. Uh, and, I mean, I've been introduced to The Hobbit, Years before at junior school, one of our uh, teachers there like read as part of The Hobbit, a bit with the riddling specifically. Uh, and I'd read the, the whole book separately then, so I kind of had some grounding already. Um, but yeah, yeah. Nazgul in the Shire and all that sort of thing. Woo! It was great stuff. Who or what is your biggest inspiration in what you do? I think we'll have to say Jervis Johnson for that, actually. Having um, worked with him a bit more again recently for the first time in like 20 years. And honestly, the the sensation of familiarity, of a yin and a yang locking together in the world of games design. Um, he, he's, he's always really inspired me by his approach to games design, his thoughtfulness uh, and openness as well about it. So I've always kind of aspired to that as an inspirational sort of like he is the one to follow. That will really embarrass me saying him my, my saying that. We should get him on here, actually. Yeah, I'd love good. that. Um, did did he ever beat you in a game ever? Many times, many times. Um, we we talked about this because it kind of bothered him after a while that uh, it never even crossed my mind because we used to play a lot, um, virtually daily uh, when we could, um, but not always, but certainly weekly, and. We did the first few battle reports, and it kind of became a thing. They were very, very popular. Uh, this is in White Dwarf magazine for people just tuning in. And they were very popular, so it was like, brilliant, do more of those. People love them. And we're like, all right. So we start, started regularly doing a battle report for White Dwarf in uh, once a month. And 
it never even crossed my mind because I say we played a lot and Jervis generally beat me. Not always, but quite often. Uh, he always came with a, a good army list and a good plan in mind. And I, mean, I never had a plan. I just had an army and let chaos reign and work from there, basically. But after a while, he came to me and sort of said, oh, you know, it, it bothered me for a while that you always beat me in the battle reports, but I, I'm over it now. And I, it, it never even crossed my mind before that moment, frankly, that that was happening. And I was like, huh. And it made me think about it, why that happened. And it's because the battle reports were always really chaotic affairs because we had to stop and start. We had to take photos. We had to take notes. People would wander by all the time and like, give their sage advice to what we should be doing in the game and all this sort of stuff. And then we'd break for lunch. We'd come back and finish. So it was a hugely fractured game that we had to play in practice. Uh, and, of course, that worked for me because i thrive on chaos basically and i didn't really have a plan in the first place i'm just sort of like taking advantage of what's happening and doing sensible things whereas jervis came in with a plan and the plan kind of always fell apart because he couldn't keep concentration on that as well as keep notes and well as take photos and all the and all the other interruptions and stuff like that so i think that's what screwed him over more than anything else as well as just luck as well i tend to be quite lucky on the dice um so he ended up with this thing where it's like, you know, people with T-shirts on saying Jervis Johnson couldn't beat me either and stuff like this, which was all very hilarious, but a bit harsh on him because honestly, no, he's a great player. He beat me all the time, just not in a battle report because extraneous circumstances meant that I was better at doing those than he was, um, but not through talent or anything like that, just through, as I say, I thrive on chaos. And that's true when I game in general. I don't generally have a plan. What's your best value budget hobby purchase of less than twenty pounds? Paint and brushes is is what I'd invest twenty pounds in, which won't go an awful long way these days. But honestly, good paint and a good brush are seventy eighty percent of of painting a miniature well, in my opinion. Uh, with some of the remainder of good undercoat actually as well. Um, and if you haven't got good ones of those, it does make your life so much harder and it's, it's so much more of a disappointing experience. Um, so I feel they're the things that give back the most in terms of investing in, putting money into it rather than any, you know, magnifier or some special bit of kit like that, uh, which you can pick up that cheaply sometimes. I can never get on with them personally. But, yeah, put it into some decent materials is really what it comes down to because they will pay off. They are so much nicer to use, especially modern uh, acrylic paints. are just amazing. I started off um, when I was a nipper. You know, we were using Humbrol paints. Um, so they're like basically little oil paints and things like this. They would use white spirits with it and stuff like that. So the modern sort of like water-soluble paints are just stunning. Um, I haven't got into airbrushing I kind of mean to at some point. You probably need more than 20 quid for that. But um, from what I'm seeing are the results people are getting, with the, again, with the, the modern airbrush, airbrushes and more to the point paint you can get for them, uh, are very, very good. So, But uh, at a fundamental, paint and brushes, mate, that'll pay off. Don't worry. If you could live in any historical period, where, when and why? I wouldn't go far. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a great student of history, as anybody who knows me will tell you. And um, I've read a great deal about history, admittedly mostly military history, but that's social history as well. And I have to say, uh, I, I'd like, if I was going to go back, I'd go back to the 1990s, or the 1980s, perhaps, and not really any further than that, because life was not better in those days, except for a very select few who, you know, wrote books about it and things like that that we get to read now but for the vast majority of people no we we live like gods as far as they're concerned and i'd rather keep hold of that than take my chances and go back in time and like are you an aristocrat do you get tuberculosis <laughs> and so on yeah get a sword in the gut within 24 hours yeah <laughs> Yeah, smallpox, you know, all kinds of fun ways to meet your end uh, and not much help to be had for them as well in comparison to the modern world. So, yeah, yeah, I'm a great student of history, but I have no particular desire to live in it. Do you think there are any underutilised settings or periods in tabletop gaming? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 uh, the, the ancient world, the truly ancient world, as in Assyrian Empire, Egypt, Hittites, and so on. I think that's underutilized because um, people assume it's I don't know too basic, just guys in nappies with sticks or something like that, and it's not. It's not at all like that. It's actually a very sophisticated period of history. We just don't know an awful lot about it. Um, but I feel that that doesn't see enough because um, it, it's it's proper like Conan esque fantasy when you get down to it, uh, and that doesn't see it, it, enough leverage. I think you know the whole cradle of civilization, Babylon, all that sort of stuff, uh, which are, are some you know evocative terms just to throw around just to say those words. So I think that gets underutilized. What might people be surprised to hear that you're not very good at? Oh, this is the one. When I briefly looked over your list of questions earlier on, that actually stood out in my mind of like when I thought about different answers for this. Things I'm not very good at, there's a lot of these, uh, which may probably not surprise most people. One that might surprise people I'm not good at is I'm not good at chess. Uh, I'm not good at playing chess. I obviously I understand how to play. I have played many times. I am not good at it, <laughs> and I think it's because of what I said earlier. Is I kind of thrive on chaos uh, when I'm gaming, and there isn't any of that in chess at all. And I like the patience to be able to develop a plan over a period of time. I've, I've had a few rounds with Go as well, which is again a, a fascinating concept of a game, but kind of not for me is what it boils down to, and I accept that. I'm I don't thrive on long-term building towards a plan in that way uh, in my gaming. But that's okay. As I've come to realize there are many different kinds of gamers. There are many different kinds of games. It's finding the ones that suit you, really. So, yeah, that's my first one. Um, things I'm not good at. The other one I would actually list is that I can't run to save my life, despite the fitness thing that we talked about briefly earlier on. I am decently fit but i've always had asthma and i've also got a duff leg from a motorcycle accident and i smoke so if the zombies come for me they're gonna get me i won't get 100 yards basically so they were the two things that came to mind about things i am not good at what have you recently changed your mind about nothing immediately jumps to mind but maybe that's just the course of things i don't know i'm gonna have to yeah unfortunately i'm gonna have to say russia Something I've changed my life. I've always kind of like admired Russia, for, uh, say, student of history, Second World War, stuff like that, and they accepted, yeah, they're dreadful crimes and so forth, but they resisted invasion and, you know, saved us from the Nazis and so forth. So I've kind of like batted in their corner to a large extent over the years, but unfortunately the, the Ukraine war and stuff has maybe take a rather different view about Russia, of like, oh, maybe all the bad things that are said about them are true, and it's not just Western propaganda. Although, on the other hand, that's all we're getting on the Ukraine war. So, um, yeah, that that is something, though, I've kind of had to have a little heart-to-heart with myself about how I feel about that thing now. I don't know. It makes me unhappy to think about that. When was the last time something in the hobby surprised you? The success of a Masters of the Universe um, board miniatures game that Archon did <laughs> That's, that apparently has landed really really well and I guess I don't know why I imagine Master of the Universe wouldn't cut the mustard in some fashion but I think um, one of the things that's been remarkable actually that surprised me in general uh, if I'm honest but over a period of decades is how fast and furious games come out now compared to when I started out because it, it was a, a long tedious process to make games back then and it's become you know, this is not to denigrate what's being made now because it's marvellous content. There's just so much more of it. And it's because digital publishing um, and print and particularly now digital miniature making has really accelerated the process just massively. And you can't imagine how fast it is compared to what an old doddling grognard type like me is used to. So that, I think, uh, at its heart, you know, if I trace back from old oh, Master of the Universe tabletop game, it's, it's like it's because of that, and that now can reach the point where we do a Master of the Universe tabletop game or GI Joe or whatever, just for funsies, basically. 
because it's possible. It doesn't have to be this this massive uh, industrial investment process to get to that point between Kickstarter and the aforementioned capabilities. Small studios can do just about anything. So, in so on some levels, the games that come out all the time kind of surprise me because it's like what, and it's like, and they often do quite well. It's like, well, more power to them, really. Tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. I think, and it's heart, it'll be that desire for randomness. Because uh, people often rail against randomness, luck, being a part of their games. Uh, whereas I think of it myself as being an essential ingredient in a game. Uh, like I say, we go back to things like chess and go, I'm kind of like, all right, it doesn't fire me uh, in quite the same way. That being said, how you handle it in your games um obviously key to whether it just feels like random chance or whether you have some control over what's going on and how much control and how much the fatal finger of fate can fuck you as well. So that would probably be the biggest bone of contention I can think of on a, on a really meta level that most people might have with me and designing games the way I do. Uh, but tough, that's the way I do it you know don't like it go design your own games which people do which is fantastic um it's one of the things i've had to accept about myself is i design the way i design and um some people like that and some people don't but that's okay (laughs) (laughs) tell me something you once believed about the hobby that turned out not to be true one thing i used to believe about the hobby that turned out not to be true uh i go you go systems are good which, I don't know, on, on some fundamental level, I kind of sort of believe that, but I used to passionately believe it and, and fight back against every um, attempt to do other things. Because I thought it was good for you to be able to use your whole army and, you know, work to a plan, ironically enough. Um, and then the opponent used theirs, but actually, in practice, most of the time, it's, it's a bad idea because it, it kind of disassociates one person at a time from having much of an active role in the game for too long and as i've got older and perhaps a little bit wiser i've realized that's important you've got two people at the table you need to make sure they're both having a good time two or more people at the table and you need to make sure they're both having a good time uh, on a reasonable sort of tempo and i go you go off and fights against that unless it's such a limited number of units that you know, you can get through your turn very quickly, or the increments are really tiny, or both. So there, there are circumstances where you still do it, but am I as committed to it as I once was? No, I am not. Uh, a lot of crunch, actually, to be fair, that I, I inflicted on gamers back in uh, the 90s when I was working on things like 40k. Um, these days, I wouldn't do that now, because, you know, crunch by which i mean you know lots of modifiers lots of die rolling comparing die rolling uh having to do maths in relation to your dice and things like that it was something i just didn't hesitate about back then i just thought oh cool different way of doing things uh and that in itself as well too many different ways of doing things these are all kind of bad actually as part of a design you need to um be a lot more disciplined about it and i mean referencing back to jervis again that's one of the reasons things i admire him for he is very disciplined about factors like that and considering it properly uh which is something i've learned to do over time but i didn't used to sorry about that guys it was kind of made fun wacky games though i'll give it that much are there any common hobby myths and misconceptions that make you roll your eyes the way people treat dice as if they they will follow probabilities when and uh, I'm going to tell you guys, after 30 years of working with dice, they don't, you know, you, you can make some broad assumptions about what may be possible by doing that, but don't get too locked into the idea that the handful of dice you roll over the course of the game will somehow uh, fit in with probability that's worked out over thousands of instances, thousands and thousands of instances to get that sort of like perfect bell curve or what have you. You pick up your dice once in the game and roll them. The dice don't know anything about bell curves. They'll just give you something entirely random. (laughs) And, you know, over time, the probabilities will tend to emerge in a general direction of the way that, you know, 
those probabilities would tell you. But um, only by rolling enough dice. And they don't always obey those probabilities at all. So that's the thing that makes me roll my eyes the most, that people make such massive assumptions about a 16% difference, for example. The classics of hitting on a 3 plus or hitting on a 4 plus and how much difference that makes. It's like it makes way more difference how many dice you're rolling, guys. Way more. Um, so that sort of stuff um, is the thing that I tend to like, because eh, it just gets treated as such an iron cast rule. And what particularly amused me, though, there was a great, what was it on? It was on Daka Daka, I think, years ago now. Somebody had um, tested different dice. They, they, it was a guy who taught engineering students and, and basically he'd got hold of a few thousand um, like Games Workshop dice and casino dice and things like that. And he tested them to see what they rolled, set it as a job for his students. So they got big shaker tables and they just went through and recorded the results. And he found that the chances on um, – it was specifically the, the, the standard like little white D6 that you get in Games Workshop games, common around the world, that one is. That's why it's in there. The chances of rolling a one on that were somewhere around 23%. Now, technically, it should be 16. So some things are miss there. Uh, the best ones he found were the casino dice. Uh, ironically enough, and uh, they were actually, you know, within the proper odds of probability, but even they varied a bit. So, even that, you know, you can take statistical probability at face value and so forth, but it still doesn't necessarily apply to the tools that you're using. So, that end of thing, that's what I think people tend to blow past a little bit when they're, they're talking about balance uh, and, you know, probability chances of things happening or not happening. It's not quite in the realm of everything's just a coin flip, really, guys. But it, it's it's kind of headed there, more so than most people give it credit for, anyway. It's been one of the fun things about Zeogenesis, actually. It's, that uses D10s. Now, I've had, like I say, 30-year career of designing almost exclusively with D6s all that time. I have a long, intimate relationship with the D6 in all kinds of different forms. And moving to D10s was just like, Madness, madness personified. We're using D10 dice pools. Um, and I mean, D6s, like I say, they're a lot more unpredictable than you think they are. But they, 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 they kind of have their parameters. If you roll enough of them, they'll, they'll generally, etc. D10s is like starting over again. So that, that's that been exciting times grappling with how truly random rolling like four or five d10s can be because we're not totaling scores it's individual target numbers you know the model has a target number to hit it so you try to roll that or above so roll me five d10s tell me how many of them are eight plus and it's like oh none of them oh all of them oh most of them just oof. so that's been good to account for overall a new challenge are there any particularly satisfying mechanics you've either created yourself or came across whilst playing someone else's game? Oh, I'm going to nominate myself for this one, actually. The Blast Marker mechanic um, that we introduced in Epic initially, I think. Which is just thing about having little explosion markers next to a unit to show... And it, it's, it's another stage of damage at its heart, um, but it's not removing models. Uh, it's just showing that they're kind of like being suppressed under fire, that sort of a thing. And it's been used in a, quite a few different game systems since then. I've used it a few times myself since then. And it's a good mechanic. It's a useful tool to have when you're designing a game to have that other stage of damage, which isn't actually killing things or knocking off hit points per se. Uh, basically like a temporary damage source which suppresses them or whatever. Uh, so conceptually i think that's that's a good one um the other one i'd nominate is the system that i use in blood red skies um for doing three-dimensional combat with because that's a world war ii fighter combat game but it doesn't use altitude or anything like that it uses this uh, the system that i call the advantage system where it says we don't care about how high up you are basically it's like are you at an advantage relative to the fight? Are you neutral relative to the fight? Or are you disadvantaged relative to the fight? 
being advantaged means that uh, you you have more options. Basically, being disadvantaged means you have less, and it's only if you're disadvantaged you're actually in danger of being shot down. Until that point, you know you, you're just looking and diving along with everybody else, but in a disadvantaged state, that's where you're most vulnerable as well. So again, it, it's a way of almost combining damage with other factors at the same time, but without it actually being damaged to the units. So I think that's another particularly kind of interesting example of all, almost the same, if, again, if you go on a very meta level, conceptual design mechanic applied in a different way. What are the last couple of games you've actually played? Slip Runners, which is a game I'm developing for the Zeo Genesis universe, which is, we're starting to roll it out. We've appeared at a few shows and things like that. It's basically like a anime-inspired mecha-based combat game. But Slip Runners is actually a spaceship game that I forced onto it because we're um, going to publish it through Blaster Magazine. They publish periodically, and um, they do little games. And it's it's literally like a, a spaceship racing game. But we've tied it into the background for the universe. So I've been testing that quite a lot. That, that's the, the last few games I've actually had. I've all been of that. Um, and before that was Zeo Genesis itself, the, the mecha combat game. Sorry, they're not mecha. They're not that big. The the giant armoured suit fighting combat game that we're doing, um, which is very familiar territory. It's like, you know, 32 mil figures. So that that's kind of like you... That's the, a tactical, which is the smallest armoured suits. And they go up from there, basically. But we must be fighting with uh, tacticals and mediums so far. And I've been working on that with uh, Gav Thorpe, who's uh, doing the background side of things as well. So, yeah, we've been playing a fair bit of that as well in, on the tabletop realm. When building a regiment, do you prefer monopose or multipose miniatures? It depends on the troops and it depends on the game. Is the, the the honest truth of that? I mean, there's some where monopose is is absolutely right. You know, if you're doing pikemen or something like that, you don't want multi part models for that. Um, but if I'm doing, you know, a war band of some description, whatever description, whatever flavor you want to call it, then yeah, I want multi pose figures. So yeah, depends on the troop type. Is the the response to that one? Yeah, mo- monopose zombies. That would look a bit weird, wouldn't that? We've all got the same. Yeah, exactly. Island. You're entirely <laughs> missing the point with monopose zombies. Um, you know, especially with plastic miniatures, which I love. Part of the fun is you know cutting them around and making them your own. So um, yeah, but on the other hand, like I say, if I'm doing a, you know a very regimented kind of a unit, then I've got no problem with them being in regimental poses at all it depends on what it is as a rule I prefer multi-part it's actually uh, I mean I was talking about Zero Genesis that's one of the things for it is that we were doing injection molded plastic and trying to make them a bit more you know flexible poseable choose your own weapons choose your own bits to go on them uh, for part of that fun modeling aspect of it because it, it's kind of started to vanish a little bit and I'm, I'm sad about that because for me, that's very much part of the hobby. I say like making things your own. So uh, it's good to be in a position to hopefully give some of that back again. Do you prefer metal, resin, or plastic? I pick plastic every time. If I can have all my needs supplied in plastic, I'll take it in plastic things because it's the easiest to work with out of all three of those. Um, I don't have anything against metal miniatures. I don't have anything against resin miniatures either. But if I have the option, and uh, yeah, because plastic's just hilarious, easy to cut up and stick back together in different forms and stuff like that. I mean, I used to do it with metal because, as far as I was concerned, again, because I'm ancient, super glue's been quite the wonder for me and hot glue guns. It's like, ha ha, you can't stop me now. Um, but if you're using plastic, you, you get away from 90% of that issue straight away. You know, you can just so easily put things together so easily you know shave off any bits of flash that you don't want and all the rest of it that uh, is obviously a joy to work with do you prefer a black white or zenithal undercoat it depends what's going to go on to it next um if it's bright colors i always use white if it's 
darker colors, I'm fine using black. I mean, I used to use black undercoat forever. It was always what I used to use. Uh, and then just kind of work up from there. Because I say, I came from a background where originally I was painting in Humbrol. So uh, black undercoat wasn't such an issue there. It is more of an issue for acrylic paints, though. So what I've actually landed up is I tend to use gray quite a lot now. Um, because that's a, a middle ground between the two. You know, you can darken it down easily enough. Um, or bring it up easily enough without having to go through quite as many layers as uh, using a black undercoat. So I feel like that's a, a fairly happy compromise. Do you have a, a typical basin strategy? Do you like the golf course or do you like them to be busy with rocks and skulls? And... Yeah, somewhere between the two. I, I do believe that a base can be too busy um, and then it starts to distract from the miniature that's standing on it. So to me, you know, the miniature is the star, not the base. So I, I don't like um, overly complicated bases. Um, a lot of people have ones that are like metal grids and things like that. I don't tend to like things like that, uh, unless it's specifically for an environment where at, that's entirely appropriate sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I'm not fond of guys who look like they're lugging around a load of stuff on their base onto the battlefield. It, it should disappear as much as possible as far as I'm concerned. Do you have any advice for those who want to follow your path? Yes, I get asked this reasonably often, actually. The biggest thing is do it. Don't don't be too hesitant. There is a just a monster mash of opportunity out there now. Uh, in some ways, it's a lot it's a lot easier and it's a lot harder than when I started out. Because when I started out, there were very 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 few companies making games, and they were all companies. Uh, so getting a foot in the door there and working your way up and blah, 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 as I did, that that's, I say, both harder and easier to do now because there are more companies doing that. But at the same time, there's more people aware and more people interested in it. There's a whole generation, basically, that's been fired up by the idea of doing games and gaming and has much better tools for doing it with uh, than when I started out. But that being said, you have much better tools for doing it with. So write your rules, stick them on a PDF, put them, on, put them out on the internet, you know, find supportive groups where they're interested in similar things. Social media's given this amazing, amazing capability of like linking people across the world in a way that we just couldn't even dream of back then. So, you know, leverage that. And, you know, if you make it, they will come over time. And either someone will pop up and say, hey, I can make miniatures. Do you want me to make miniatures for your game? We should try and do this. And you can start cobbling it together that way. Or you can take it to a company and say, look, I've done these things already. Give me a go. I can work with you guys, etc." So I think the opportunity is out there. But the, the biggest thing has got to be to do it. Don't, don't think about doing it, but do it. That can be tougher than it sounds. I understand that. And finally, what are you working on right now? And is there anything else you'd like to share with the listener? Well, I, I, I slipped this in earlier on. Uh, I'm working on a anime-inspired armored suit fighting combat game called Zeogenesis for a company called Best Hobby in America at the moment. I've been working on that for a couple of years now. And we have a, a playtest option. You can go and get the playtest rules right now. You go on zeogenesis.com or besthobby.com. You'll find like links there to, to sign up for the playtest list, and you can download uh, like an alpha version of the rules that we're, we're actively seeking playtesters for at the moment. So basically, it's 32 mil. Um, if you imagine um, the dudes are 32 mil, right? Little guys running around. The armored suits themselves are like 65 mil tall, up to 80, 90 more. And it very much re re resolves around the, the idea that the uh, the armoured suits, what we call Zeo forms, are the stars of the show. And the smaller guys are like support units for them. So it'll be drones or mechanics or snipers or what have you. So the model count on the game overall is quite small. Um, but it, so it emphasises the larger guys. And it's quite a dynamic game. We don't, we don't have clumpy, slow, dreadnought-like things. You know, they're fast. They're fast and... Uh, have a lot of guns on them so i'm particularly excited because uh, we've got a video game coming out called armored core 6 uh, later this month which is a big the armored core series has been a big inspiration for us um in doing zeogenesis along with things like apple seed so 
so that's the big thing. Uh, and we're looking to do. I previously told people we weren't doing Kickstarter for this, but apparently we are because it's good for mailing lists. So later this year, early next year, maybe uh, Kickstarter for it. But we're working on injection molded plastic miniatures for that, which is uh, even in these days of like modernity, is still a process to get your head around. Let me tell you. Uh, so that's very good. In the intervening time, and uh, kind of related to Zeo Genesis because it's set in the same universe. Um, I mentioned I'm doing a, a spaceship racing game. Well, spaceship game. It just happens that in this scenario you happen to be racing called Slip Runners, which will get published in Blaster Magazine uh, later this year as well. Just finishing up that now, which was a, a, a twin challenge mechanic for me of using two mechanics I hate in the same game. It's been good. It's worked out. It's actually quite a good little game. Massive thanks to Andy there. Just a lovely, lovely guy, as I'm sure you'll agree. And a wee bit of bonus content now. Before we started recording with the main questions, we were talking a wee bit about Thomas Pirinan being over in Nottingham, meeting up with everyone, and how it sounded like he was summoned by John Blanche. It was very like, you know, getting yeah. this call from like mythical Across figure. Across the sea, come and yeah. see me, Thomas. <laughs> well, to be fair, he, he'd been talking about it for a while. Um, that he, he really wanted to come back over to Nottingham and, and catch up with all those old doddery types that he used to work at Games Workshop with us. Um, <laughs> so, and I mean, I've, I've been working with him on and off um, over the last 10 years or so mm. on different things as well. So I've been in touch with him, been over to Finland a few times myself, which is beautiful. Yeah. He's going out to Helsinki. So he's a great guy, really great guy. Did you get out for a beer or that or? Uh, yeah, we went out and did lunch in Nottingham, um, and then he came over on the Thursday, and we went out. There's a there's a local restaurant that's quite famous called Mister Man's. It's a famous Chinese restaurant uh, close to where I live in Nottingham, uh, which is set on the edge of Woolton Park, which is a big deer park. Um, just sort of like weird. It's it's an old aristocrats, literally. You know, it's Woolton Hall. It's it's where they filmed Batman a few times. It's been stately Wayne Manor in the background of Batman in a few movies, yeah. the Christopher Nolan movies. So it's a very posh, sort of like country house type thing, and surrounding beautifully manicured park, uh, which still has deer in it, uh, which has been maintained as now, of course public property thank you comrades so we went for a walk <laughs> around in that which was really nice beautiful english you know sunlight slanting through the trees little fawns running around in the grass kind of like very nice it was like Lovely perfect stuff. really yeah he was talking about exercise too he was talking about uh, he's i don't know if you did it this time but he was talking about you used to go to the gym oh yes uh, together yeah no i've just been out today actually with my trainer uh working out yeah when we were um when we moved sites um, from the studio where we were kind of like, it was just the studio and the factory and everything was different for Games Workshop. is often a different place. But it all came together on a single site um, in 99, I want to say. Or was it 97? Anyway, so we moved on there, and, which was horrible. But on the bright side, it had like a, a small, you know, works gym on there and – Thomas was still working with us at the time, and he, he got me and Jazz and Robin, actually, to all um, start going down the gym, um, which I'd never done before in my life. I've always been, been a kind of like asthmatic, sickly kid, so I was convinced I wouldn't be good at anything like that. But he, he made such a good case for it overall, and it was something different to do because we, we, we live very brain lives and he made the good point that it's good to do something with your body as well because your body wants it your body's actually made to do things um and it gets unhappy if you don't uh, you may not be conscious of it but it does and it's true exercise is very very good for you. your head quite apart from anything else and it's a good way of clearing your mind or focusing it depending on circumstances so we, we used to go down several times a week to the gym there and i got into a habit of doing it dropped out dropped back in again over the years and since i started working with him again he kind of encouraged me to to pick it back up um and i got kind of over the pandemic i got on the fat side um not for the first time but i was kind of like a bit horrified at myself and i was like right that's it <laughs> making a change so the last few times i've seen him i've been able to say you know check it out you know yeah, yeah. i've been working out at home and i'm going to a personal trainer and da, 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 da. and uh, my wife's picking it back up as well again she went for the first time 
in a long time with me to the trainer today, which was great. Yeah, it is important in this sort of sedentary time, isn't it? Like I listened mm. to, I think it was Katie Bowman, she's a biomechanist and she was saying, you know, being sedentary at your work isn't anything new. Like you had wood carvers and stuff hundreds of years ago, but the difference was there was still a physical life outside of that, whereas nowadays you go home and you maybe hunch over your phone or stuff. So it's, yeah. it's very... It's very full on with us, just crouch posture all day. So, well, I, I think that's why it became particularly sharp over pandemic time because you know you're staying in. I mean, I, I'd started on this years back when I started working from home, when I started freelancing all the time. Great, you know, don't have to go into the office, no commute, just work from home. And actually, your body starts to kind of wither away because you, you're not even walking the distance from you know the car park to your car or to the bus. And then over from the bus stop and all the little things like that are no longer part of your daily routine. And, you know, your body goes, oh, all right, then all we have to do is sit in the chair. Well, you don't need legs for that, do you? Um, <laughs> it, it gets really pernicious. Um, so, yeah, you've got to, got to particularly watch it. And, of course, the pandemic did that to everyone for a while. So mm -hmm. I was a bit kind of prepared for it. But even I, you know, slipped into some bad habits. You start ordering in your food, you know, and you maybe don't eat proper things quite as much as you would because, hey, we've just got to stay in. So, yeah, very, very easy to get through, get into a, a bad state through that. Yeah, I walk in those same trails over and over again. and <laughs> <laughs> Walking is really great. Walking is a, a yeah. great solution for it. Yeah, it really yeah. is. I'm not saying everyone should go to the gym. It's like, do what's right for you, really, I think is the biggest message to take away from it. Uh, for a lot of people, walking is a great solution. Uh, I'm kind of a bit sad, really. We, we've got like a small nature reserve just at the end of our road, um, which was one of the, the draws about moving to where we are now and buying a house. But we hardly ever go up there because neither me or the wife are very much into walking. You know, it's, well, it's a bit sweaty. It's sweaty <laughs> and hard work sort of thing. Yeah, I, I find that walking is, is brilliant for sort of creative work too. Because you know, if you're if you're writing, mm. it, it, there's a good case that if you're writing something creative, a lot of the writing could be done away from the computer. Oh you god, know, you yeah, could go absolutely. For a walk and figure it out. And I, I view my time in, you know, in front of the actual keyboard as you know, literally writing up the things that you've been yeah, thinking about elsewhere. You're already clear on, yeah. Uh, and that that's another thing about working from home is that you have to kind of come to terms with just because you're not sitting at your desk it doesn't mean you're not you're not working mm -hmm. you know you can be doing any number of different tasks doing your, you know doing the laundry or whatever but your brain's churning along on the things that it's churning along on so um yeah and and walking's great for that because you can literally you know set your mind free while your body wanders about Thanks very much for listening to this episode of the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. If you enjoy the show, then please do share it with someone else you think might enjoy it too. And be sure to check out our Discord community of like-minded hobbyists, which you can find at bedroombattlefields.com forward slash discord. It'd be great to see you in there.